All right, Greg Chalmers, uh, welcome to Shamrocks and Shanks, the podcast. Um, really, really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to come on. Uh, I've kind of started kind of, you've come to more prominence, obviously, as a player for a long time. I've been aware of you, um, but definitely you're uh, engaging social media presence over the last uh, couple of months. Mm-hmm. Um, Tongue in cheek, but some really good stuff we'll talk about later. Um, and then your Hack It Out podcast, which you do with uh, Mark Crossfield and, and another couple of guys there. Um, so for the listeners that may not be kind of totally aware of where you are, don't have to go through the whole life story, but just kind of a brief mm. rundown where you're at in your career and how you got there and kind of, you know, just a little bit of that story, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, I've played on, uh, I think, four or five different tours around the world. I, I started off, uh, I played in Asia. I turned pro when I was 21 uh, in 1995. And uh, I, I played Asia for a season. I played, then I went to Europe and progressed on to the, to the European tour. And obviously I've been playing the Australasian tour um, all my life. I played Europe uh, for three years, two on the main and one in the middle on the challenge tour. Um, and then I qualified for America in 1990. Uh, rookie season was 99. I uh, came over to the States and I've been here on the PGA tour uh, for, you know, bits of, you know, probably out of 26, 24 years, probably about 18 of them on the PGA Tour and about six on the Corn Ferry. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've, I've been up, I've been fortunate. I've never spent longer than uh, a year on the Corn Ferry. So a year or two, I always seem to get my job back on the PGA Tour. So I've been pretty lucky, had a, had a really nice run. And now I'm turning 50 in a month. And so I've been sort of ramping up training and practice and, uh, and trying to get ready for, you know, getting after it on the Champions Tour if I can go qualify. Yeah, absolutely. And that kind of leads us into that kind of first question, which I really wanted to kind of ask you was, um, you know, having that advantage of being on tour for a while and having those interactions with like true pro-ams or true various kind of sponsorship days, you would have been around a lot of club golfers. And I think for the majority of club golfers that we as coaches would work for, we'll talk about your coaching later on. Um, a lot of them will be trending towards that over 40 kind of going into that 50 age bracket. Um you talked about prepping for the the champions tour now in, in a couple in next month, actually. Um, is there anything specific or anything you could lend a kind of hand to for those club golfers in terms of how you're prepping for kind of turning 50 and trying to play competitive golf? Yeah, I would say this. Um, I, I, there's a, there's quite a bit to it in terms of when you do it for a living. And, and I looked at it about five years ago, I got it was about 45. I got, I found out I've got arthritis in my lumbar spine. And so I had to address that. That was causing what I thought was just normal golf pain. Turned out it was, and it wouldn't go away. It turned out it was actually damage. And it's just from overuse. So I, I addressed that with some, some anti-inflammatories. I'll hit that with drugs. But then I also, and I, I take that kind of daily and, and I monitor things and make sure I'm looking after my, you know, my, my levels of, because uh, it can affect your kidneys and all this kind of junk. But anyway, yeah. um, Basically, I got into getting better mobility. I had quite. I found a thing called functional range conditioning. It's it's joint mobility and it's measurable end range strength and joint mobi- mobility, which is different than flexibility. Yeah. Um, it's really really cool. And 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 I picked up uh, about twelve degrees of uh, it, like hip interior hip rotation. Uh, they measure it, and then you go back six months later after doing it, you can sort of see where you're at. And I just felt like that took a lot of stress off my spine. Um, and uh, cause I was now moving my body better, my hips better. And I've also got tight shoulders. So we had to address that as well. And so I went on a bit of a journey. Um, and what I wanted to do was I just, what I realized too, is, you know, the stats all support that if you don't lift weights or if you don't maintain strength, you're just going to get slower and slower and slower. Um, and I went to, a, I found this trainer and he, he introduced me to a lot of these protocols and, uh, we got started on training and, and with a view that just to not lose more speed. Yeah. Um, and what we found was I picked up speed, so yeah. I'm really enjoying it. And so as you get older, it's just something that you can keep in mind and it's just for your overall health, um, you're going to lose, I think the stats are like, you know, 1% of muscle mass every, every couple of years or so you got, you're just going to get weaker. And so you, you're going to be healthier if you look after yourself and with mobility and strength exercises, whatever that may be. Yeah. And uh, it can lead to better golf, hopefully. So I'm just trying to extend that window beyond 50, mate, as much as possible. Because I may play until I'm X years old. I don't know how old that is, but I may not. But I'd like to have the option, right? Yeah, you and... want to be making the choice, not have the choice made for you. Correct, uh, correct. So, yeah, so I... I've been I've been enjoying it. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, you're. I, I think we nearly, de- like what you pointed out there is a really, really good point. And I say to a lot of my players on, on the lesson tee, it's like, you know, if you don't do anything, 
it's not like you're going to be the same next year. You're actually going to be Mm -hmm. worse off. So there is a level when we get to a certain age that we need to be doing these things just to maintain as opposed to, oh, I'm I'm going to do this so I can be stronger or faster. I'm like, no, no, you have to do this to be the same as you are this year Mm -hmm. as to be the same next year. I think that's a point that doesn't get lost. That's a really, really valuable kind of insight. And, And again, as you said, coming from a from more a uh, career kind of perspective to the to the club golfer but the same ideas i and I, I do think we are seeing more players definitely become more aware of that kind of the physical side of things and if they want to improve what they do physically they have to uh, improve on the golf course sorry they have to improve where where they are physically with their body too well i think it's been fascinating to watch with the advent of you know tpi now with their ability to measure range and measure what you have you know range and strength Um, there's some things for some, you know, for the coach, for the coaching world, dealing with students who are over, you know, in that age bracket, in my age bracket, where you're, you might find out you're just not capable of moving in a certain way without training. And that's the other thing I'm just, I'm trying to, I'm trying to build a better car. You know, I'm trying to turn it, turn a Toyota into a Ferrari somehow, you know, so I'm trying to be a better athlete. And I, and I think at this age bracket right now, uh, I've been doing it about pretty seriously three to two to three days a week now for for about four years uh, with a view to just continue to do it. It's just part of my life now yeah. um, that, that I won't deteriorate as quickly, but I'll just be, I'll be a better athlete as I, as I, I want to be a better athlete over 50, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like better than the other 50 year olds. And that's my goal. Yeah. And it's like, when you look at the guys there, like, like Harrington would be a great example and, and, and Phil previously before he departed, let's say, um, mm-hmm. but, but Harrington, what he's done in terms of speed, like in nearly ramping it up and nearly creating more speed now going on to that champion store. And it's such a huge advantage. So it's, it's definitely something you have to maintain at least. And then, as you said, you're looking kind of one, two years down, where do you want to be having that, the choice, whether you want to continue playing or not? Um, Absolutely. With, with going back to that experience, as I said, you know, when we look at those club golfers and, and kind of the first section of this podcast is really just how can we help them from from your mm-hmm. perspective, your advice. They've, they've heard me enough times. Um, what's that one thing? Like, is there a common thing that you look back and you see a lot of club golfers struggle with more often than not, really? Like that one kind of glaring thing that you would see a lot, a lot in those club players? Uh, I would say there's, I mean, we could dive into any area here, but I, I would say a lot of times... Um, they're not very good at reading conditions, uh, meaning, you know, into the wind, downwind, adjusting for club stuff. Um, I think the other thing, pros do a much better job of learning from their environment. What I mean by that is if I normally hit a 9-9, 150 yards, and, and I pull one up and it comes up 10 yards short, then I, I might go, oh, I'm on, I might be on the bottom of my numbers today. It might not be going as far. It might be a little cool. You know what I mean? Like we, we yeah. tend to learn much more quickly from that versus amateurs will just – They'll get 150 on the next hole and pull 99 out again, you know. And and so just that clubbing piece of it can be really interesting. Um, there's some stuff that I would say to people too. If you if you enjoy golf, just do some things, whether it's through podcasts or through coaching or every year, try and add some golf knowledge, right? Try and add some knowledge yeah. on whether it's improving your body, improving understanding how the club should move, understanding how you know you should putt better or things that you can do. Just keep trying to improve your knowledge. It's no different than any other sport that you watch and you're a fan of. It's just that you're playing it. You mm-hmm. can talk to some guys can talk about the NFL for hours. Like their knowledge of it is amazing, right? And that, but they don't play. Yeah. But they, they've improved that over years. And that's what you can do with your golf game and start to improve. And, and just from learning from different people, I'd advise that as well. Yeah, a, a lot of um, – I, I work quite closely with a guy called Mark Bull um from from england who's a great coach and a lot of the stuff that we talk about is that perception and understanding from the player like you can you can actually change a lot in the player if you get them to understand or perceive something differently so that coming from that flow of information and they suddenly go oh now i understand it i mightn't have to hit thousands of balls trying to grind it but now i understand that maybe that can shift the kind of the process enough in terms of that stuff so um yeah. moving on to your kind of forte let's say um you're you're well regarded as one of the best putters on tour over your career um it's it's definitely kind of what you're known for doing really really well um and you started coaching and putting now which is we're going to get into a little bit more later on um can you give the club golfer home a little insight into your perspective of what makes a great putter let's say and and and, you know taking into account there would be individualistic kind of patterns in every in every individual but you know roughly speaking as a general idea okay yeah so i would say from a from a technique standpoint i have like Oh, I'd say five or six things that I like to see uh, and within a realm of, you know, acceptable parameters. And, and what I mean by that is 
I don't think you you can have your eyes over the ball or just inside the ball, wherever you're comfortable. That doesn't have to be, you know, I have mine on the inside corner of the ball, so or, or, or about half an inch inside the ball, and I check that with a mirror. Um, I believe in stability in the lower half. I like to have just, and I feel like that forces the the top half, the shoulders, to do a, a lot of a lot more of the work. I, I'm not a big believer in a massive amount of movement in the lower half, particularly from ten feet in. There is going mm-hmm. to be um, a lot more movement, obviously, as we get further away from the hole. But if you look at a lot of actually the the people who do this the best are usually the girls and anyone who puts backhanded. They're usually pretty good, stable lower half. Um, I like uh, uh, very much a look and I'm a look and go react to the target guy. I like at some point there has to be a give over and I try and putt much more. I move towards a world of um, putting like you don't care. And, mm. and I do a lot of stuff trying to be free and freedom. And if putts aren't dropping for me, I actually go faster, not slower. I try and okay. think less, not more. And so I try and be much more athletic about it, but that's how I have done it for years and how I learned to do it. Um, so I don't spend a long time over the ball. Um, I spend a lot more time just, uh, assessing the, I, sp- I might assess the shot and then, and get an idea of how much the break, but I try and how much it's going to turn or whatever, but I try and let my instincts take over. Um, because we know now we have these, you know, those machines that roll balls pretty perfectly from any, from 10 feet and down, you know, on a big breaking putt, the window of high speed to low speed lines is quite wide. Yeah. Um, so we're standing there trying to be perfect, get this line right. I'd rather you stood there and find somewhere you're comfortable aiming and just to, and and let your body adapt to the to the speed of the putt. Um, now, granted, I've got a lot of hours under my belt, uh, and so and one thing I have learned over the last few years when I haven't played as much, some of the skills deteriorate based on the fact that I'm not doing them as much. Reading greens, particularly, okay. um, is is much harder for me now. Yeah, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I think I was very lucky, mate. I grew up at a place that all it had was a putting green, and so we did a we didn't have ranges, you know, where I grew up. We had a net, so we spent a lot of time putting, and uh, I think I just hit the hit the jackpot that I got to do it and uh, and do it started doing it really well. Yeah, it's it's kind of um, those those really really players that are really great at things. You you look at where they come from and, and their environment and how they grew up, and nearly the environment shapes their skill development. So kind of what you're talking about there, if I, you know, yeah. like probably the, the greatest example is Sevi and how he kind of learned like on a beach with a stick, you know what I mean? And becomes mm-hmm. one of the best ever, you know? Um, yeah. it, it's a really interesting concept on putting because it's not that it's my forte in any means, but um, I'd be a good friend of mine, Stephen Sweeney, who's a putting coach on tour, always talks about one of the first things he does to players is he has those nice kind of gets the ruler out and gets those five golf balls in a straight line to the hole and just checks can the person see a straight line so you know what you're talking about there about the where do the eye lines in or out and that player mm-hmm. being able to see those so it's i think when you like like yourself and when you talk to really great putters or great putting coaches it's not this magic x plus y equals z beautiful mind on the on the blackboard it's normally kind of do the simple things really really well and mm-hmm. they lead to great performance and putting. It, would you kind of agree with that? Yeah, I do. And and look, and I, I I'm I'm open to you know when when I'm dealing with students through the the Skillist app that I do online teaching, um, mm-hmm. I'm open to the putter moving slightly inside you know the target line on the way back. Mine goes inside to inside the target line. It arcs kind of nice, moves what what you would call on plane, I guess. Um, some people I've teach they you know they're more comfortable going inside to down the line. I'm not a big fan of anything outside the line, uh, the target line, like cutting across it or anything like that. Um, I think that's kind of unnatural for given how we're bent over and how we're, we're standing. So um, it, it, it's definitely, you know, there, there's some things that I like to just see within the parameters, what's, what's good for that student. Uh, but there are, it's, it's difficult, right? Like it's, yeah. you, can, you can roll, a, I mean, I can make the ball miss, hitting it through a very tiny gate. I was just doing that today in my practice. I had a little T gate set up. And I hit several balls through that. There's still a lot of variables out there once that ball gets rolling that can mess it up. So um, it, it is very tricky. But um, it's if you enjoy doing it, it's it's a lot of fun. And um, I think I, I, I talk a lot to like my buddy Brad Faxon. Um, mm-hmm. And if you look at someone like Fax, he's a great example. I've, I've said this before. Great putters to me and great players in general, but great putters to me. when they You can see them when they look at the target. They look like they're hunting, right, versus – Someone who is a what I would call an average putter or a bad putter, they look, they're trying to think the ball into the hole versus someone who's more athletic and just just letting it happen and trusting, a lot more trust with how they go about it. 
Um, and it's an eternal quest to try and find that, I think, for a lot of people. I, I love that idea of, of hunting more than uh, kind of thinking into the hole. And, you know, even your concepts there, I really like that. It's like, okay, well, I have my preferences, what I like to see, but they're within parameters. So it's of not course. this strict, strict guideline. Um, yeah. we, we mentioned at the start, and you kind of meant, briefly touched on practice there. We mentioned at the start your social media and um, it's great. Like I, I absolutely love it. Like the tongue in cheek stuff about the autographs. I think it's fantastic. It's great mm-hmm. to see that side of players and um, like really, really impressive. So well done on that side of things. What I've also noticed in, in the last while and when, since I've started following you is a definitive um, kind of trend of, of illustrating your practice habits and drills mm-hmm. and tasks. And I think that's absolutely fantastic because I think it's one of those things that we're probably, when you look at sports in golf, we're probably one of the worst sports for how we, learn or practice whatever phrase you would like um mm-hmm. what what do you feel you've learned about practice through your career and i know you've mentioned in previous podcasts that you know when you like were an amateur and before you maybe mm. very early stages of pro you were like like five hours out and not putting it what what have you learned throughout your career and what advice or guidelines would you like the club players um besides following you on, on social media i think be fantastic mm. but what guidelines would you give them to have when practicing uh i would say have a plan, like some kind of plan. And I don't mean have to write anything down. I just mean like I go to the course with a plan of what I want to get out of that two hours. Or And I don't practice. Like people think at my age bracket, I used to practice for eight hours, but now I practice for about three hours. Yeah. Like in a two to three hours, it's not a lot of time for a professional really. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you have an hour, I've actually done this where I've, I've counted and I've held how much I could get done in an hour. And and you can get quite a bit done, and when particularly when it comes to chipping and putting and you can hit 50 putts in about 20 minutes. Like it's really not hard um, and get quite an effective amount of work done. I would say figure out first, are you practicing a new move or a, like a technique thing or are you practicing contact? Are you practicing um, or how are you practicing how you're going to play on the golf course? And I, there's two different, there's a few different ways to go about it. Yeah. So I try and marry, okay, this is my technical session. And I'm going to spend, and not long, 50 balls and see if I can get contact down, see if I like how I'm moving. And then I'll go and do something else for, or just go and have lunch or something and then come back. And now I'm going to hit shots to targets and mm-hmm. pretend I'm playing golf. Um, and so you'll see me, I'll post things about that. I think what I see amateurs do is just very haphazard. Um, yeah. You know, like I, 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 you never really, and this is the problem in golf, you never really own it, right? You have to keep earning it. I still work on my setup and my alignment every single session I do. I put a, a T-square down. I've got a little mirror to check my shoulders because I have. we all have tendencies and I tend to get a little closed or a little open my shoulders, a little off, I aim differently. And so I set that up every time because if I'm going to hit 50 balls, I'd rather do 50 just right, yeah. right? Then putting in, you know, I look at it like this way. If you're baking a cake, you don't want to put a whole bunch of rubbish in there right? You want to put some good ingredients. And so that's kind of how I look at it. The other thing that I do vastly differently now, I'm all about quality rather than quantity. When I was younger, I might've hit 300 balls, but there'd be hundred good, hundred bad and hundred trying to find the good again. Right. Yeah. Versus now I just leave after the first 50 or hundred and I'm like, okay, I'm done. It's a good session. Well done. And you leave confidently, right. Versus trying to, you know, outwork it and things like that. This just, I think that's, I'd rather go for quantity over quality. Uh, but I'd say just have a plan, you know, like what are you trying to get out of this session? If you've got a coach, talk to them. Hey, ask them, what's a great way for me to practice for, for this? And, and, and I've only got, and tell them I've only got to hit 50 balls. Like it, and, and I've only wanted to, I only want to be there an hour, right? What's the yeah. most efficient way to go about it? I think you could do that too and, and just get a little more organized about how you do it. Yeah, there's some, some fantastic points in there, I think, and definitely along with the way I kind of see things too, which is kind of number one, have a plan to, to what you need to improve on. And then be very kind of just in a, in a nice way, or is this about technical improvement or is this about performance? And then splitting those two things and, and definitely definitively working on both and 100% quality over quantity. You know, like it's uh, when you see the best at it, it, it definitely is the quality and, and the, the focus and the attention that they're putting in where that attention goes, the learning happens. But sometimes you see those players on the range and they're nearly like trying to get to the, trying to find the, the great swing by hitting as many balls as possible. And the right. more they hit and the quicker they hit it, the sooner they'll find it. And we know like from experience that just doesn't work. Um, no. <laughs> unfortunately. Um, 
can we discuss a little bit on performance? And and it was this really tracks back to again, just because when I was researching this and, and listening to previous podcasts you've done and, and kind of just fascinated kind of listening to your experience. I thought you had some really, really great insights and, and obviously performing at a high level, winning on tour and, and winning an Australian Open twice. You, you need to be able to good in, in terms of dealing with anxiety, let's say, or dealing with nervousness. And I thought you had some beautiful illustrative points talking about, you know, staying in the present and and touching things that were like on you to kind of help with that. And could, could you kind of talk a little bit about that maybe for those club players that, you know, maybe get a little bit anxious, a little bit nervous in, in for the club championship or captain's prize or anything like that? You're right, right. So, yeah, look, I, I learned a, a, a while ago that, you know, most of our anxiety is is either past or future based, you know, like I'm, if I, I'm sitting here right now with you, I've got no, I got no problems. I got no stress, but if I start worrying about my bills, I got to pay or, you know, stress or shots I've got to hit or problems of in the future. So one of the things I learned, I remember my, my, tra- uh, my sports psych, he did a trick with me. We were walking down the fairway and he said, I want you to tell me what you hear for the next 30 seconds. And so we're walking down, I can hear a lawnmower on the golf course and there was a, a bird chirping in the wind and someone else said something. And, and I walked 50 paces and I didn't think one thing about anything in the future or past. It was all just, so what, what he was trying to get to me was staying in the present is sensory base. What you breathe, you see, you touch, you hear. If you can get into that side of things, so I get into my breathing and I feel it and I, and I feel the, the breath coming in and out of my body. And I might spend, if I've got a big, if I was playing for with Tiger Woods at the Players' Championship tomorrow, then I might spend a bit of time in the morning just doing that in the locker room before I walked out. So, because if you want to play, I play my best golf at about six or seven out of 10 on the anxiety scale. I don't mm-hmm. play very good at a nine or a 10. Obviously, I'm too amped up and I don't play good at a one either. I'm too flat. So, but I, that means if I'm a six when I wake up in the morning because I'm playing with Tiger or somebody or it's the club championships, I've got to take steps to just manage that. And that could that usually involves breathing and just sitting um, and just trying to feel relaxed and just spend five minutes doing that. Avoid coffee. I think that's been amazing. You know, sometimes people who get really nervous, they'll be like, oh, how many coffees did you have, buddy? Oh, I had three espressos. Well, Man's you might want to you might want to give that a rest. Um, you know, so... There's some things you can do, but there's, there's part of it too is I think the biggest thing is enjoy the challenge, right? And you have to say what I like to say to myself, I like to live most of my life if I can in a state of gratitude. So I just say, thank you. Thank you for this challenge because I need it right now because mm-hmm. things that are easy in life are kind of boring, right? Yeah. So you, you have to, rather than getting all worried about what's going to happen, it's a very hard game, accept the challenge and go see if you can meet it. Right. Yeah. And, and, and stay in that state of, hey, this is really cool. I've got a great opportunity here today. I've got a chance to do something really cool um, versus worrying about. It's a different way to look at what's in front of you rather than, oh, my God, I hope I don't mess up. I hope this. I hope that. Well, guess what? You don't have control over it. But it'd be great if yeah. you went in with a good attitude anyway. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. I remember talking to uh, Jonah Oliver, who's um, who's Cam Smith's. Um, you, you probably know Jonah a little bit. Yeah. Um, an Australian guy. Um, and he was talking about that on, on the podcast when we had him. And personally, he was saying, you know, if you say you get an invite to the Masters and what they should have on the back of that invitation is we'll feel nervous. We'll probably shit a brick on the morning of. But but to accept the invite, you have to accept all these things are going to happen with it. And it was like, right. how many people would turn it down? Like you wouldn't. Like, But you again, as you said, the price of admission is you're going to feel a little nervous, a little anxious, a little apprehensive that these things are going to happen. And like. No better example than, you know, if you went to your first experience at, at, at Augusta uh, mm-hmm. at the Masters on, on the first round, if you could briefly tell that story, like, you know, that's probably the best example. Uh, yeah. I can think of. <laughs> yeah. So it's 2001. I, I had qualified for the Masters. I finished fourth in the PGA the year before, the one where Tiger beat Bob May in the playoff. But anyway, so yeah. my first Masters, I was, I, was, I was off early. I think I was playing with either Sandy Lyle and, and Chris DeMarco. So all first timers get a past champion. So, um, I'd had a good, nice preparation. I was playing pretty okay. I thought this is, I feel all right. Like it's like 7.30 in the morning. I'm off at about 8.30. And I think it was about 7.45, 10 to 8. I think uh, I was on the putting green and I saw Byron Nelson and Sam Sneed were about to hit off, right? And I wasn't, I was, I was very, I've always been pretty self-aware. So I was, I was like, yeah, I feel pretty good. Like I thought I'd be more nervous in this. This is not a big deal. 
Good deal. So I wandered down. I thought, I better, I got to watch this because I want one of the things I wanted to do that week was if there was an experience that I never knew when I was going to go back. And as it turns out, I've never gone back. So I'm really glad I, I took in as much as I could. So I just wandered down. I had the time and I watched these guys hit off. And, you know, so I watched Sam Snead and Byron Nelson hit off and, and uh, everyone goes crazy. And I, and uh, I, I think internally I went, oh, 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 this is a big deal now. So I got a little twitchy and I went and finished my warm up. And then I got on the first tee and I hit this little heel cut and just down the rope line. In those days, people could stand down the left side. And uh, I hit a guy right above his eye, knocked him out cold. Um, and so he, he's probably waited 20 years for tickets and I've, and I've messed his morning up. Um, and so he's out on the ground with a golf ball size. You can see the dimple pattern, this bulge that had come out Jesus. of his top of it. It's terrible, right? So now I'm really stressed, you know, and it really affects golfers poorly, right? Obviously, you've yeah. just really killed someone. So anyway, and I'm trying to manage that. And then the ball had actually gone 20 yards left through the pine tree. So now I know I've got this really stressful shot through a bunch of pine trees uh, to get it back towards the, the fairway slash green. And so I ended up, once I got to that shot, I hit that through the pine trees and I hit a person in the shoulder on the right side of the fairway over the other side of two for two. Uh, so it was a nerve wracking start to my first <laughs> masters. And I went on to shoot like 78 and miss a cut, but yeah, it was, um, it's a great experience, but yeah, not the way you want to start. And most people are going to go, you know, once, once I hit the second guy, it's like, yeah, yeah, I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> might as well keep walking in yeah it's might not as well keep walking in um so if we move on to the coaching section and, and we mentioned earlier like you've more moved into the realm of coaching um working a lot on skillist online uh people can find you there we'll, we'll give the kind of contact details at the end um how have you found moving into the coaching sphere uh, and what do you feel as being kind of like the advantage of your playing background and and has there been any disadvantage to the playing background do you have felt Oh, oh, yeah, of course. Um, okay. I think I think one of the biggest things that I was I was trying to be aware of, and you can never really know until you start doing it. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm starting 25 years behind other coaches. So, and I think one of the mistakes good players can make, professional golfers, they think because they've played at a high level, they can coach at a high level, and that is not the case. And I knew that, right? So I tried to baby step into it. I tried to be much more. Um, I'm not going to change the world here. I don't know enough about the technology as well. I hadn't, I wasn't a full verse on track, man. I was, you know, I had, I just hadn't been a coach. Yeah. So it wasn't something in, in some areas I was way more confident in, in putting and things like that and short game. I'm, I'm very happy to talk about that. And I like doing that, but I learned very, very quickly. I was actually coaching full swing at a club and I'm not anymore. And I'm really grateful because I, I don't want to do that. I don't, yeah. I didn't enjoy it. Um, and, and I didn't, and, and here's the thing, I, I didn't really want to build knowledge in that area. Right. So, because I didn't really want to be a coach, I want to play the game. And mm -hmm. so the coaching side of it is what I like now is it, it's, it's kind of a hobby for me. And, and it's just, it's on skillist. I don't have a lot of clients. It's, it's pretty comfy and easy. Um, it's a different price point, I think, than an individual lesson you, we get with someone, because obviously you don't have access to a lot of either technology or the person one on one. Yeah. Now, having said that, though, it can have an it, this piece of it. You get information that you can keep forever, um, and you may get, in my case, you may get more information. And I try and explain it to my students. I may give you more information just in case you need this for the future. Yeah. Um, and then I nut down what I want us to work on if we're going to stay together as you know student sort of coach relationship. But it's it's definitely something that. Um, I think one of the miscons, and it's almost a shame in a way, one of the misconceptions amongst fans or people is that the pros know what they're talking about. The reality mm -hmm. is the coaches know how to coach. The yeah. players know how to play. Um, and so, and I've had good coaches in my career and, and I picked pieces from them and I've had, um, I haven't had bad coaches obviously, but I've, I've learned something from everyone and that's all I'm trying to do really. I think, I think the biggest thing I thought was, you know, sorry, rabbiting on, but the biggest no, thing no, I please. was the biggest thing I was sort of struggling with. I learned very quickly. You can't help everyone like this. I may not be the coach for you. And I had to make peace with that because I think sometimes your ego wants you to be, Oh no, I can fix this. And, uh, and, and it turns out, well, no, it's harder than that. You know? Um, I think the biggest thing too, mate, was I wasn't, I wasn't prepared for students who weren't as a, the student coach relation. I wasn't prepared for students who weren't prepared to move or at least be comfortable trying to move differently. I was yeah. amazed with the amount of people who kept pushing back on 
that feels different. I don't like it. But I'm like, yep. why would you? And so I had, <laughs> it took me a long time to learn how to get around that. I'm like, why well, just sign up for a lesson if you just want it to feel the same? Oh yeah, <laughs> it's fun. Well, it's interesting. Well, it's really welcome, interesting. welcome to the fold, brother. <laughs> yes, yeah. I found it quite fascinating, and you know. And then I had one student once, um, and it was a chipping. And chipping is quite difficult as a skill, like finding yep. the bottom of the arc, moving slower. Um, it's it's quite challenging for a lot of just you know Joe Blow golfers. Mm-hmm. And this guy, he was a, probably a twelve off the you know fairway to tee to green, and, and about a thirty chipping. He was really mm-hmm. poor chipper. And we were experimenting and trying to get to a place where we were comfortable and happy and move some steps forward. And he looks at me and he goes, wow, he said, I'm really going to have to work. This is a lot harder than I thought it would be. And I thought, I said, mate, you've built a, like he built this really successful company. I said, did it happen overnight? And he goes, no. I said, welcome to chipping. I said, it's not going to happen overnight. <laughs> you know? And I find it fascinating. I think sometimes golfers, the misconception is that, you know, it should be easy sometimes because I, and I don't know if it's because of online content or people make it sound easy. It's yeah. just not like, it's really hard to change how you move. Yeah. Right. And so, but anyway, it's, it's been an interesting journey, but I, I'm enjoying my online community and, uh, and it's just a little height side hustle. I side hobby. I enjoy. I remember I talked to a coach called John Dunnigan um, and he runs a skill coaching Alliance with Will Wu. And I was talking about the lesson I gave and I'm like, you know, I, like, you know, I'm doing all this study and I know all this information and, you know, like, and I went and had this lesson and the player, the person just, you know, it just took a lot of like talking discussion. And he goes, you know what, man, like as much as you want it to be simple, you know, cause you, you, you want everything to go really well. Sometimes you just got to get into the weeds with it. And I think that's just, as mm. you said, you just can't help every player. Um, And then some players nearly need to be kind of like, uh, you know, told in a very certain way, like, listen, you know, information is information. Information doesn't change anything. You know, as much as you'd love yes. it to do, you, you got to apply that kind of functional kind of idea. Okay, well, I got to go practice this. And a lot of times for us, it's two human beings interacting. So yeah. from your experience where you have a player that moves the putter head kind of a little bit kind of outside the ball's target line and way back, normally you would say blah, blah, blah. You could say it to that same player and because of their environments or whatever they've been through, they might not want to do that. And then you have to adapt. And that's where mm-hmm. the, the the art of coaching, I think, um, supplements are really kind of goes on top of the teaching kind of thing. And, yes. and that's, that's that only comes with experience in my mind. But the really great thing that, uh, you know, and this isn't the bad mouth players at all. Um, moving into coaching, I think the great thing about you is your awareness of, of that fact. You're like, you know, what? I don't know everything. And, you know, I wasn't comfortable with the full stuff. So. I think any coach, I've, the great coaches that I've talked to have that awareness of, of, you know, it's okay not to be great at this and I can get back. Yeah. That, that's yeah. okay. You know, I, 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 I thought it was, a, it, it, what happened was it kept, if the animal kind of fed itself a little bit because the expectations were extremely high oh, yeah. because, you know, I went to a club and they've got, oh, we've got a PGA tour, ex PGA tour player coaching us here. And so reality is you had just an average coach on full swing stuff trying to figure out what was best for you <laughs> and, uh, and it was it was challenging and so i quickly learned uh you know if i'm going to do this i either need to a and i could i could study and get harder if i want to be yeah. a coach but i quickly learned um I mean, for me it was more of a side hobby that i just wanted to fill some time until i turned 50 and and i quickly learned it's not for me um yeah. I, I like the online stuff i like if i was going to be a coach i'd want to earn more towards the specialized sort of short game stuff um and that'd be an avenue i could go down uh, we'll see how this playing side of it goes first yeah absolutely um in terms of your own like experience of coaching throughout your career um it, it, like would you describe yourself as a player who's had a lot of coaching or have you been kind of more self-reliant and i, I remember meeting you very briefly um like it was like a two second um at honda a couple of years ago and you were on the range and you were using the kind of the the trainee aid that has the kind of hook on the trail arm and the elbow and kind of go oh, yeah, here yeah, like yeah, a, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but like, you know, have you been a player that's been like taken well to coaching or have you been more self-sufficient throughout your own career? No, I've always had coaching uh, mm-hmm. since I was about 16. I've probably only had, oh, four coaches in the last 30 years okay. um, that of, of, you know, some kind of consequence. And I've learned different things from, and you know, if I look back at, it was some parts of it that I look back at now and sort of go, oh, I wish we didn't go down that path for a long mm-hmm. time. Um, and so to me, the proof is 
is always in the ball flight. And now, unfortunately, when I for a long time, uh, we didn't we didn't have track man, and we didn't have the option to that. That has been just an absolute godsend, I think, for yeah. a lot of players and coaches at a high level, because now you can understand better. Well, this is what creates this. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, but I'll, I'll give credit. I, I was coached by Dale Lynch, who's coached a lot of good young players from Australia, Aaron Badley and and uh, Matt Goggin and a bunch of guys. And then I moved on from him to um, Colin Swatton. Oh, yeah. uh, Colin coached Jason Day and yeah. and took him to number one in the world. And so Swatto was great for me. Um, and so and then as, as I got older, I kind of uh, I kind of just wanted someone to check in with. And and I now see a man named John Sinclair just down here in Fort Worth. Yeah. And John, John. Is, yeah, 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 John is known. Um, we used to do all our testing, um, like our, um, what do you call it, uh, like K vest and things like that yeah. with John. Three D stuff. And yeah, three D stuff with John. Yeah. And so. So I met John then and through working with Cole and that's where Cole would get everyone to go. And then now I just see John every, and to be honest with you, mate, I might, I might see him twice a year and I, vi- yeah. I send some videos to him every month or so. And so, but most of the time in my age bracket, it's just about maintenance and make sure everything's moving. Okay. And, and get after it. Yeah. I remember working um, with, a little bit with Barry Lane, um, God rest his soul um, a couple of years ago. And, you know, it was, I was kind of a young coach at that stage and kind of like, you know, I was like, Oh yeah. Like, like, and tried to like do all these things and, and God bless him. He was just like, you know, I, I can't change that stuff. Like it's a, you know, he was like 61, 62. That's yeah. it's like, you yeah. know, you got to keep it simple at that stage where you're like, you know, like what you said, kind of look after the fundamentals and then maybe more external stuff and ball flight and stuff might kind of have more influence. Yeah. Um, if, if you were looking at it from a coaching perspective and, and I know you're talking like it's more a little hobby at the moment, do you feel from your perspective as a PGA tour player and then looking at it from a coach, what would be kind of like some of the keys when working with an elite player versus a club golfer? Now I know you're dealing with two very different animals, obviously. Right. Um, right. Would you have a perspective on that with the limited coaching time so far, or would it be something that you wouldn't be too sure of answering? Uh, yeah. I would say, based on the small amount I've done of club yeah. club golf, um, I think your first job as a club coach is to figure. Unless you have like a, you already know the client, right? Mm-hmm. You already know they're they're a regular. Yeah. Um, I, I was always asking, I the club I worked at, what's your, you know, what do you want out of today? And the amount of times the answer was, I want to play good this Saturday. Right. And I'm like, okay, that's a different lesson than what I was expecting. Right. I thought we were going to go on a little journey together. And you want to play good in an hour. Right. Um, and I think, I think that the thing about it is, is that pros are, pros are much more open to the idea of long term gains. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm now just, I implemented, I, I, you know, I went and saw a ground force expert, Dr. Scott Lynn, and I oh, implemented, Scotty. yeah, Scotty. So we, we did some work, I don't know, about a year ago. Mm-hmm. And, and, and about nine months later, after working on just moving my hips better and, and getting my pressure different, um, I'm like now starting to see the benefit of that. Right. And, and I knew it was right. And I knew what I wanted to do. And so just, just, I say, prepared, just say that t- time frame one more time. About nine months. Right. There we go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> just, but I was happy to go on that journey. I look at it like a journey of like, I got some more knowledge of how to move better and what I need to do. I can still play good while I'm on this journey. It wasn't like, yeah. oh, you have to rebuild the arc, Greg. I'm just yeah. like, no, no, you can feed this in. I started to move. And this, when I got it right, I was like, oh, wow, that's amazing. That feels really good. Um, and so I went on a little journey. I think pros typically are much better at that piece of it. Like as a, And so as a coach, that gives you a little more leeway, right? Mm-hmm. Because you don't have to convince the guy that it's, that it's right yeah. um, or that it's, that it's going to work. So usually... All right. If you, I mean, if you're good at what you're doing and you understand what to do, you, you pretty much you should be golden there as well. Yeah. Like what you're saying is spot on. But yeah, that was that. I think that's the the big thing for amateurs is and club golfers is. I would say to the club golfer, if if I was coaching, if I want to go down that path a little more seriously, is okay. What do you want to be better in a year? Because I think yeah. I can, then I can help you. Right. If I'm good at coaching, um, yeah. I think that's a like. Let's go on a little journey because. We don't need, and we don't need a lesson every week. I think we can get this done in once a month or something, some kind of plan yeah. when we, we put together where we, okay, in a year's time, we're playing better golf. Yeah. Um, I think that'd be nice, but it's, it's almost like you have to educate the, 
the person, the amateur on, okay, this, this could take a minute. Yeah. All right. It's going to take. <laughs> I, th- I think it's always a fun because you kind of like, from my perspective, when I get to on the last tee, I'm like, okay, how can I help you today? And it's like, I want to be more consistent, you know? Mm. And, and they're like, or mm. I'm playing it, or I'm, like, you know, I'm playing in a, a team event tomorrow. Um, and it's kind of like, okay, um, well, you know, let's start with some goals. And I, I think that's a really nice way of phrasing to someone is, okay, well, you know, how would you like to be in, in next year? You know, would you still like to be thinking of everything you've seen on Instagram and social media or would you like to have something more reliable? And I think that's definitely it's on the coach a little bit to educate players about that. And I, I mm. you know, I remember I remember talking to Foley a little bit about this and where we're more and more delving into this quick um, satisfaction world. Do you know yeah. where we want everything like that, that, that? And that's the polar opposites of how we improve in golf or how we improve, I think, in any skill, really. You know, it takes mm. time. You know, and then you, I, I think we get a little bit, and I've been guilty of it before. I get, I think we get a little bit kind of uh, d- dissuaded by, um, or fooled even by pictures on Instagram and um, where we mm. see motor control. So, hey, just can you get there? Yes, you got there, but we don't see any motor learning. So right. that, that's not going to be there tomorrow or the next day. It was just there when you really, really focused on it. And I think that can be a little bit confusing for the club golfers because they see these great changes visually and aesthetically on posts. And then they go, oh, I, hey, I can do that. I'm like, mm. you know, and, and there's some really great, um, I think Shaheen Giovanni does a great job in Montreal where he kind of always mentions the timeline in his befores and afters and how long that's taken to develop. And I think that's maybe what you said there. And that's why I asked you to repeat it was that's got to be the message as we move forward is, Hey, this shit takes time. If you want yes. it to be what you want it to be, and if you want it to be permanent, um, when when we look at that coaching sphere, and again, you know, taking into account, like you know, obviously looking at coaching in, in this perspective, being a bit part time for you, like there's there's many different ways, and, and you kind of talked about this in practice versus the technical versus performance. We can help players in, in many different ways in performance, technical, physical, psychological. Even would there be a hierarchy of those in terms of how you would place those, um, you know, or, you know, when you're developing your coaching or kind of where are you at now? Are you kind of saying, okay, well, you know, bearing in mind, I'm kind of really just kind of getting into this that I just want to develop a certain skill or are you kind of looking at a kind of certain area for yourself? Uh, no, I would say, I, I, I think mate, that I err more towards performance first, nice. meaning yeah. if, if, if you, I don't care what it looks like, like, and, yeah. and and I see this with putting. Sometimes I have some people who come to me who are very, very good at golf. You know, scratch golfers, things like that, good amateurs, mm-hmm. and they're like, yeah, and they're looking for minute gains. And I'm like, well, we may we may actually get worse here, right? Like, so, and you're actually really good at the game. Like, you're in the top one percent, even higher, right? So, it's it's tough sometimes in those things. I with those people, I'd rather talk more about. Okay, let's talk about what's going on on the golf course. Like, what's your routine like? What are you going through mentally? What do you like under pressure? Um, and get more into those side of things, the performance piece of it, right? Because sometimes you can have um, a pretty okay technique, um, yeah. and and it's not really what needs to be worked on. It's just that you you know you you acquiesce to some poor thought patterns or some poor patterns in movement when you get under a pressure. I you know there's plenty of different ways that you could go about. I lean more towards performance than I do technical perfection i think as australians we fall in love with pretty golf swings versus americans fall in love with low scores Mm -hmm. that was the biggest difference i learned when i first came to america a lot of college kids coming out not really technically that sound to be honest sometimes some are but a lot aren't but man they Mm -hmm. play good right then they they can score and they go low yeah yeah and versus australians are coming over we've got these beautiful swings we've got a bunch of training aids we all like and 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 like what'd you shoot ah one over like Dude, but what I hit it pure. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. we got. I got. I see it when I go home every year. I go home and I'm like, "You guys, you don't understand, man. That's that's nice. You got that pretty swing, but we well, now we need to work on just getting it in the hole quicker, right? Yeah. Um, go play. Go play under pressure. Go learn about yourself a little bit. Um, I think I lean more, watch more towards performance for for most people who move the club pretty decent. Yeah. Um, obviously, sometimes as a coach, I think you see things that hey, we could make some big gains here. Mm-hmm. um if we if we fix a couple of things but um that's up to that coach to figure it out and and and, I, and also understanding the work required to get there you know and then educating the the, the amateur on hey this, if we do this this is where we can get to um so and look and i think not much gets talked about athletic ceiling 
right? Like yeah. quite often people think they can just, they're all going to be awesome. I've stood next to Tiger Woods and hit balls and I will never be able to do it. There is an athletic ceiling, right? There is, <laughs> I will never, be, <laughs> yes, there is absolutely an athletic ceiling. I've stood next to Dustin and Davis, like a bunch of dudes and watched them hitting and going, yep, I ain't ever doing that. I hope he plays bad today. You know? <laughs> yeah. so, he's crossed. Right? He's crossed because he's yeah. better than me. And so your athletic ceiling might be, you might have reached it in yeah. some areas, you know, like you might not be able to attain some of the things. So that can be really challenging to face. But um, the journey is what I'm more interested in. Yeah. Right. Finding out how much better I can get. Yeah. Well, I, I love that approach from a coaching perspective, even like you're, you're hitting all the nails in the head for the coaching thing, by the way. Um, you know, the idea of a player coming to you and, and nearly defaultedly, like, you know, I, I would say for the majority of club players, if they're not achieving their goals score wise or performance wise, they're going to go, where would they meet you for the lesson? Probably on the lesson tee on the tee deck. And mm. it's like, well, you know what? If you're a decent enough coach and you take time to pause and breathe and start talking to your player, you might actually find out that, as you said, if you go messing with the shit they're doing now, technically, there's, the, the gain that you might get is so minute. While they could be a complete disaster when they go on the golf course in terms of course management, you know what I mean? And that's where you right. can make, and I think that's a really, really smart, really, really smart, intelligent way of looking at it. And so it goes back to, I think the communication side of things as a coach, like when you first meet a player or get a player like that mm. 10, 15 minutes at the start, just talking, asking as many questions as possible. So, so important. Um, you mentioned tiger there. A little bit. I'm sure everybody probably asked you about that. Is there any kind of like uh, noteworthy kind of interactions or, or meetings or kind of that, you know, you would kind of like to discuss or kind of mention? Or was it just everything was just kind of like a little bit surreal when you kind of inter uh, encountered him? Oh, I've known, I, I played with Tiger for the first time when he was like 17, um, 16 or 17. We played the World Cup, the Eisenhower Trophy together as amateurs. I was representing mm -hmm. Australia and he was representing Europe. And that was, a, uh, sorry, America. And that was the first time I had, uh, had ever seen him hit it. We really hadn't heard a lot of him about him mm -hmm. kind of in Australia. We were in our own little world down there at that point. This is in early nineties, early 1990s. And so we, we played the third round together and, uh, and I was like, Oh wow. It's, it was wild, but it was very, very good. The good mm -hmm. ones were amazing. Um, and then fast forward, I think he won the masters like a few years later. Uh, I, uh, I played with him the, probably the, some of the most impressive ball striking I've, I've seen in my life. Uh, I played with him at the at the uh, Memorial Tournament. I was first alternate and got put in the tournament, the field, and ended up Craig Stadler had pulled out. So it was me, Tiger, and Billy Andrade were together. And so we played the first. I shot seventy one the first day, and he shot seventy one, and they were vastly different seventy one. So you could see he had. I played pretty nice, and he he had a lot more in the tank. Anyway, <laughs> no picture, no pictures on the scorecard. Yeah, all good. Yeah. yeah. Then the next day he shot sixty five, and I went out and shot seventy five. Anyway, he um, he ended up winning ten times that year. I think that was the year he had a big, he won that event. Anyway, yeah. I read the paper on uh, I, I we bought, I actually made the cut, believe it or not. But it, he, I read the paper on Saturday morning after he shot sixty five, and he hit probably three shots that I would say are three of the best shots I've seen. And and I and they weren't anything like oh amazing recoveries. They were a nine iron that faded to a back right pin. The pin was four off the right on twelve. And it was a nine iron that faded probably a yard and a half, two yards and hit it to four feet. And the water's right of the hole. And I was like, just such a small amount. Cause we can all curve the ball um, hook and fade and cut a long mm -hmm. way. It's very easy to do that. It's, it, yeah. it's much harder to move at minute distances. And he did this like three times that day where the ball just drawed or fade just a, just a hair. It was almost like you could barely tell it moved. And I'm like, wow, that's to, to like, one was to a foot and a half, one was to five feet and another one was to five feet. And I'm like, and, he, and they're quoting the paper. He quote, he goes, yeah, I really didn't have my best stuff so far. Hoping I can pick it up for the weekend. And I'm like, oh man, we're in trouble. <laughs> like, this guy's just put his C game out there and he's just You're killed like, it. Oh shit, uh, Chalmers. We're, we're going to have to do something yes. different. <laughs> oh, so good. And I really wish for today's good players that you, they could see the best version of him. Cause that was, you know, yeah. he's obviously pretty healthy. Yeah. Um, and he, he could hit it both ways. He just did, you know, now I think he just sees more of a left to right just off the tee. He could yeah. do anything he wanted in those days. It really was flawless, uh, top to toe. So it was, uh, and I love good golf, you know, even though I play against these guys, yeah. I really appreciate that I got to see that. That was really yeah. cool. I remember um, he came to Ireland um, one year to play in the uh, the World Invitational, or the American Express, as it was yes. back then. It was in Mount Juliet. Yeah. 
And yep. he was on one, I think it was like the sixth or seventh, whatever. And it was on the Thursday. So there wasn't, it wasn't a huge gallery and I was watching him and he, he hit a section on a power five and he must've been, I'd say about 25 yards short of the, of the green pin was maybe, I would say it was borderline illegal pin cut over a bunker on the front of the green. And I'd say there was about maybe two yards between the bunker and the pin. And he's on this, and uh, you know, our, like at the time, Mount Julie was like the, the pristine kind of effort of Aaron, and the, the fairways were cut like our, our putting green space on every other course mm-hmm. in the country. And he lays this sand wedge or lob wedge open, and like literally the thing was like lying flat in the ground. And I'm like, there's no way. And he takes this swing and he just goes underneath it and it lands and it bounces just right on the collar, jumps once, just stops right beside the pin. And yeah. I was just, I was just like, holy, like, and even at, at that event, when we arrived, the morning of we arrived and we walked over. Did you ever play Mount Juliet? Yes. So you know where the chipping green was? And mm-hmm. it was like, so it's over here in the driving range over here. So I'm yep. over at the chipping green. I'm watching Ernie hit some like flop shots. And I'm like, this is cool. And all you hear is this like. And I'm like, what the fuck's that sound? And I look over and the, everybody's hitting. But the only one you can hear is Tiger Strike from the chipping oh, green. Right. And I was just yeah. like. Oh, it's it's just different gravy at that stage, yeah, and then you're like, yeah. I have no chance. I still I still gave the yeah. tour. I should I should have compacted up at that stage. Um, with with the greatest respect to, to everything we've kind of discussed, and I think this has been fantastic. So thank you for your time. Um, everything you've ch- achieved, I think one of the the greatest things, at least in my eyes, when I was kind of researching this, was the creation of uh, Maximum Chances, which is a nonprofit that you started with with your wife, and and the main goal is to. Uh, to really help families who are raising children with autism. So can you kind of give the listeners some background to the creation of this and kind of some of the history behind it? Maybe just talk a little bit about it. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, thanks for the chance to, mate, to be honest. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's very kind of you. I, yeah, so Maxim Chances uh, is named after my son, Max. He's on the on the autism spectrum. Um, and we he was diagnosed at right around 20 months. Um, and it's been a very... Um, in some some cases, very challenging journey. He's 20 years old now. He's actually off to college. He's mm-hmm. doing really well. Um, uh, very lucky he's high functioning and very lucky we could afford a lot of the therapies that he we wanted to do for him, right? Mm-hmm. And so halfway through, sort of some way through that journey, we sort of looked at each other and said, you know, it'd be great if we could help other people with this because this is crazy how much this costs. Yeah. Um, speech therapy, behavioral therapy. So we started Max of Chances right around sort of seven, eight years ago. Uh, my wife's kind of kicked it off and she runs it. Uh, small but very effective, uh, meaning we don't waste people's money. We don't pay anybody, you know, exorbitant things. And and so we we try and be really effective with your dollars and uh, get it back into where it needs to go. So we're paying for speech therapy, behavioral therapy, uh, doctor visits for people who can't afford it. And so they can... And also, I think it's something for your listeners, if, if you're dealing with someone on the spectrum, my wife is also, you know, might be further along in that journey. And so she's always very open to helping and just sometimes just ch- chatting to someone about the, what's going on and why and how and what can be yeah. comforting because they understand, right? Yes. And that's, that's sometimes that can be very, very nice for people. And she's open to doing that. Um, yeah. Her number is actually on our website, maximumchances.org. Mm-hmm. Um, or if you need, if you know, if, and mainly da- Dallas Metroplex is where we kind of stick yeah, to, we sure. stick, so, so we know all the providers and know all the yeah. people. Um, but it's been interesting. We've, we've, um, it's work, but it's challenging and fun and very rewarding and, uh, very, very happy and pleased that we've got some really nice stories of people, you know, kids who said their first words after doing speech therapy for a couple of years and things like that. So it's very rewarding. Um, and, and a nice, you know, we just want to, I don't care if I just help one person that's, I'll call that a success. So we're pleased with how it's going eight years in and, uh, and really enjoying it. Yeah. Like I, I think it's, I, that's one of the things that right, can really touch me and really, you know, when I was kind of, as I said, I, I always like to look at people and who I'd like to have on the podcast if they're available. Um, and then when I was looking at you, it was one of the things, cause my nephew is, is in a similar kind of, uh, high functioning, but so I kind of like struck to me a little bit, um, and you know the the empathy and i think in a, a same kind of with camelio and what he's gone through with, with his with um with mia um mm-hmm. the, the empathy through, through these kind of hard times that you're going through to to look at them and zoom out uh, and look and through your kind of experiences how you can then help use those to help other people i think that's an absolutely uh i think that's the best of human nature when i kind of look at that stuff i think we need more people that are kind of looking at life in that way and 
as you said, I think going through those processes, because I've seen a little bit of it, um, even having someone to talk to who's, who's yes. in a similar situation or been in a similar situation that can just listen to you and then kind of maybe maybe kind of offer some advice rather than like some of the times we're being told advice. So mm-hmm. it can offer offer some advice and, and has been similar experiences. I think um, I think that can be really, really helpful in this situation. So just just what's the website again, just in case anybody wants to kind of donate. Uh, or... it, yeah, you're fine. It's uh, maximumchances.org. Okay. Uh, for, so for all, one, all one word, maximumchances.org. So yeah, thanks so much for the chance to talk about it. It's um, Absolutely. And look, there's plenty of like Ernie Els is doing. One of, yeah. one of the bummers is, is I, you know, if I had a bigger profile, obviously you can raise more money. Um, but Ernie Els is doing wonderful things. He's actually built a whole school because his yes. son Ben is, you know, Ben is on the spectrum. And, yeah. and uh, so, you know, there's lots of good ways. And it, obviously, you know, we understand that there's, we always say to people that we know you've got lots of great options for charities. And uh, if you happen to consider us, we're very, very grateful and thankful. Yeah, no, it's, it's an awesome charity. So I advise anybody to, we'll, we'll put the links in, in the description of the podcast too, in terms of that. Um, Greg, it's, you know, I, it's, it's always, it, it's weird when you meet people in this, this kind of format, right? So it's like, okay, well, I messed you a week ago and we meet, mm. um, you're an awesome, awesome person. Um, uh, thank you so much for coming on. I, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. It's, it's li- literally like we were just kind of sitting down and, and chatting the two of us together. So um, I can't thank you enough. Um, I think some of the information you've given has been absolutely fantastic. Um, so for social media stuff, um, the in terms of Instagram, it is Greg Chalmers 1973. Um, mm-hmm. Is um, X or Twitter as they call it now? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Is that is that the same handle or what do you go underneath there? I think I'm Greg Chalmers PGA there. Okay, Greg cool. Chalmers PGA. Perfect. I'll I'll put yeah. them in the link anyway. But I advise, no worries. Yeah. I, I definitely advise everybody to give you a follow because I said like. There's some great tongue and cheek stuff in there, which we all need to brighten up our days. Shit like gets heavy enough as it is. But yeah. there's also some fantastically, as I said before, some fantastic stuff in terms of practice, in terms of learning your experiences. And um, listen, man, I can only wish you the very, very best as you go on to the uh, the Champions Tour. Um, if your character is anything go by, I think you're going to be massively successful. So uh, thank we'll, you, we'll, mate. We'll, we'll all be rooting for you. All right, I appreciate man. Thank it, you, mate. Thank you so, so much again. And uh, we'll talk shortly, maybe another time in the future. Thank you, Steve. All right, man.